And with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have a dual feature. We have two speakers, so I'll introduce the first. Uh, so Dr. Bernard Pre is a neurogeneticist and the director of the Rare Neurological Diseases Group of the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute Hospital of McGill University. He follows a large number of ataxia patients in his clinics in uh, the Montreal Neurological Hospital, uh, the Montreal Lucie Bruneau Rehabilitation Center, and the Sangonet uh, Neuromuscular Clinic. His research largely focuses on the genetic basis of neurogenetic disorders uh, with founder effects in Quebec, uh, with a special interest in ataxias and myopathies. Dr. Bray has played an important role in identifying causal genes for oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, hereditary and sensory autonomic neuropathy type 2, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy with quadriceps atrophy, uh, Paul uh, Polymerase 3 related uh, leukodystrophies, Zac congenital myopathy, and more recently, SCOT 27B, caused by a GAA expansion in the FGF14 gene. And our second speaker today uh, is Dr. David Pellerin, who is currently a uh, Neurogenetics Fellow at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology and the Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London, United Kingdom. He received his medical degree from the University of Sherbrooke in Sherbrooke, Canada, and subsequently completed his residency in adult neurology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to you too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, Welcome all uh, uh, from uh, from up north, from uh, Winterland, where I am. I'm, th I'm very happy to be here today with uh, David to talk to you about SCA 27. Uh, please change slides. The um, I must say we this is our second time of of doing a patient oriented information session. We had a first session in French organized by Ataxia Canada. It is available in French for some of you who are more comfortable in France. You can have access to it. I think. The NAF people will integrate uh, the coordinates of the of the video on uh, yes on the on the uh, chat. It, I'm delighted to be here today. It's been so exciting. I hope you will feel that in our talk today, and I'm sure for some of you who are learning that they have this condition, it will be exciting and promising for the future. Um, as you know, in in, in genetic research and 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 medical research in general, discoveries are the fruit of many people working together and sometimes even the fruit of many groups working uh, competitively without the knowing that they're working exactly on the same conditions. Our group was essentially centered on a collaboration with uh, uh, Stefan Zuckner and Matt Danzi out of Miami, who had recently played a big role in the discovery of a uh, repeat in another ataxia uh, canvas or IFC1 related ataxia. And we thought it would be worthwhile approaching them after years of looking for the cause of, of an ataxia in many families in Quebec, and particularly in a long, in a large family. So we had been looking for 20 years for the cause of, the, of this condition. After the initial discovery, uh, we integrated other collaborators from Germany, from London, from, uh, from uh, France and from India to allow us to build a really large set of patients to be able to convince the world that in fact we had found the cause of this. So let's and and, and Spain. Let's let's change uh, slides, please. So you see, the family one is the family the starting point for me. I know that some of the people very close to NAF also has have the, are in fact members of a very large family like this. So this is a family I've been following for over twenty years in a taxi clinic. And I, I remember uh, promising to the, the husband of one uh, of the, the lady that I followed that uh, almost on his deathbed that I would find this gene. It still took 18 years to find it. And, and, uh, and uh, David, who's part of the uh, discovery team, played a big role in, 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 in with the uh, Miami group to use other technologies to, do, to find it. Why it was hard, it was because often the, the gene was not transmitted to uh, in, 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 the, in a way that made the mathematics very simple. In other words, sometimes you would have a father that would simply not transmit the disease to the children, and you will understand why in a few minutes. And that made all finding where the gene was extremely difficult. So using the large family and two, two other families with a similar clinical presentation, uh, next, next um, slide, we, we used the techniques to uh, find uh, the, the, the error, techniques that are looking for repeats. The work was done on whole genome sequencing and then was validated by many other uh, next generation techniques 
to be able to find it. And interestingly enough, and, and the when we submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine, the uh, they requested that we show that this condition was not only a French Canadian condition, not only a European, we were presenting data on Australians and German and French people, but it was a international ataxia, an ataxia that was all over the world. And I'm not surprised that we're having today as an audience people from many countries in the world, because it is really present everywhere. And so we were lucky, fortunate through our, our London contact to have a collaborator uh, from, uh, from Southern India that brought in cases. And, and we realized that in fact, this was an internationally common ataxia. And, and, and David will say a few things about that. But at home in French Canada, uh, as Celeste said, um, one of my specialty are diseases that are more common home here. This is probably the commonest ataxia, yeah, even more common than Friedreich's ataxia, although the numbers are not completely out. So we really have a big burden of this disease. And this, a lot of those large families, and we're now meeting more and the other generations suffer from this condition and probably have suffered from it for, for many uh, centuries. So it's really, as I always say to my student, we work for our family conditions in, in rare disease in Quebec. So this is really important, important to us to accelerate discovery to bring treatment for a large number of patients. We probably have more than three or 400 affected patients at this point uh, that we will be able to identify in the next uh, month. Uh, we're already over 150 confirmed cases or so uh, based on family and, and genetics. So um, next slide. I'm going to turn to David to talk to you uh, about uh, what we found and, and mechanism of disease. I will be back at the end to talk more about the clinical experience and what we can do to help the people affected and, and what's coming up in terms of treatment. So uh, up to you, David. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brace. So uh, now that we've talked briefly about the discovery of this condition, let's go over the uh, the genetic aspect and the mechanism leading to disease in individuals inheriting this uh, repeat expansion. So, um, so let's just uh, start by talking about the genetics. So, spinal cerebellar ataxia 27b, which I'll be referring to as Scott 27b for the rest of the talk, is um, a repeat expansion disease. And what we mean by that is basically it's a disease caused by the abnormal repetition of a um, short segment of the DNA. In this case, it's a GAA triplet that gets repeated over and over and over again. And when that repetition reaches a certain threshold, individuals develop the disease. And in this case, in the case of scot 27 b it's caused by GA repeat expansion in a gene known as fibroblast growth factor 14, or FGF14. Now, as of today, uh, what we, uh, what the two initial studies that Dr. Britt told you about, uh, I've concluded is that individuals who carry more than 300 of these GA triplets in almost all cases will develop the disease. So that's uh, essentially called a pathogenic threshold. So above which, you know, individuals inheriting such expansion are, you know, uh, almost 100% uh, will develop the disease. However, what we also know is that individuals with a slightly smaller expansion, um, having between 250 and 300 triplets are also at risk of developing the disease, although not, uh, not always. And that's because these smaller expansions are also found in a minority of healthy controls. And so as of today, these expansions are said to be likely pathogenic because they are associated with disease in some individual, but may not all, but are not fully penetrant, meaning it is not a certainty that if you inherit such expansion, you will develop the disease. Now, what probability or, or the probability that you'll develop the disease if you if you inherit such an expansion is still not quite clear at this stage. And that's, you know, something we're, we're uh, investigating at this point. Smaller, ex smaller alleles, so those with less than 250, are generally considered to be normal, meaning that you're unlikely, you know, you, you have no risk of developing the disease, although this has been recently challenged by the few reports that have actually suggested that perhaps smaller expansion or smaller alleles with between 200 and 249 may be associated with disease in some individuals. Also, I will point out that this is highly preliminary at this point, and this is something that requires further validation. And, and so therefore at this you know, early stage, um, we still consider these, these sizes normal, although you know, this obviously may change in the future as we gather more data and as we study larger cohorts. 
Now, SCOT27B is um, what we call an autosomal dominant disorder, meaning when a parent carries a, a, an expansion, they have a 50% risk of passing it to their children, to each children. And so what we normally see in these disorders is that you have multiple individuals affected across multiple generations, as you can see in the pedigree here. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the, that's the typical case for autosomal dominant disorder. However, SCOT27B is a little bit different here, as Dr. Bray mentioned, because there's a little bit of, of, in fact, there's a lot of instability of this repeat upon transmission from mom or dad to the children. And so it is not uncommon that individuals may present sporadically or as simplex case, meaning there are no other affected relatives in the family. So you don't see, you know, multiple generations being affected. Or in some cases, you see a seemingly recessive inheritance, meaning the parents are not affected, yet, you know, multiple children on one generation are affected. And why is that? Well, there are probably multiple reasons. And you know, most likely this has to do with how unstable or how does the repeat changes when being transmitted from mom or dad to the children. So in normal cases, and, you know, as I mentioned, autosomal dominant disorders or, or um, have a 50% risk of being passed from a parent to a child. Um, there, this might not be fully true in SCOT 27B, where the expansion appear to be more likely to be passed by mother and perhaps slightly less likely to be passed by father. Also, what we know is that these repeats tend to expand when being transmitted by the mother, whereas they tend to contract when being transmitted by the father. And so we might end up seeing things like generation skipping, like Dr. Bray mentioned, where the father is affected in the family, they pass to their children a contracted expansion. So an expansion that falls below the pathogenic threshold, the children do not develop the disease, and when, uh, when a daughter has children and passes such expansion, it will re-expand above the pathogenic threshold again. And then the disease may you know, come back again in another generation while skipping one. And so we can see this pattern in some of the families. And so that's partly the reason why it was so tricky to identify uh, for so many years. Now, you may ask, you know, are larger expansions associated with an earlier onset or more severe disease course? Um, this is not so clear cut. Uh, what we seem to see so far is that there seems to be somewhat of a trend. Um, if you have a larger expansion, it you may present earlier, although this is not very strong of a trend, as you can see on the graph here compared to some of the other repeat expansion diseases. And um, a few studies now have looked at whether larger expansions are associated with a more severe disease course or phenotype. And, uh, you know, they haven't found a correlation or an association. Uh, but as you'll hear from Dr. Bray uh, uh, later on the, uh, in the talk, this is a very slowly progressive disease. And so that also complicates assessment a little bit. So how common it is in our, you know, in our population. So I just want to give you here two examples in the European population, just to illustrate why it's important to raise awareness to this disease. So this first study looked at a, at a cohort of 320 patients and from Germany, from a single center. And what they found is in their patient with autosomal dominant ataxia, 16% of them had SCOT27B. If you compare this to SCOT3, which is the most common SCOT worldwide, that was 19% in their cohort, and SCA 6, SCA 1, and SCA 2 were, you know, between 12 and 9%. So SCA 27 was in the same ballpark as, as the other common SCA, SCA 1, 2, 3, and 6. In that other study, in that second study look at from Spain, looking at individuals presenting after the age of 30, so that's, that's what we typically refer to as late onset ataxia, they found that SCA 27B was responsible for 17% of cases you know, similar percentage or similar frequency to RFC1 related ataxia, which was 15%. So it appears that overall in the European population, um, SCOT27B is a relatively common condition. Now, as for the, the people joining from around the world, um, the data about the frequency in other population is being generated as we speak. And so we don't, I think, have a as clear of an understanding of the prevalence of SCOT27B in all other populations, although um, 
we did find cases of SCOT 27B in almost all other populations we've looked at. And so it seems to be a rather global disease in most cases, in most, as, as I said, in most populations we've looked at. So now what's happening inside the cell once you, know, once you have this expansion? So FGF14 is a, is a protein that's highly expressed in the brain, but especially in the cerebellum, which is basically that part of the brain that controls balance and coordination. And we know that this protein is actually important for the regulation of these sodium channels, which are important to regulate or to, uh, to allow these large cerebellar neurons, which we, we call the Purkinje cell, to fire rhythmically. And so it is thought that when you disrupt the function of FGF14, that leads to uh, mislocalization and loss of fine tuning regulation of these sodium channel, which lead to uh, absence of rhythmic firing from these large Purkinje cell, which therefore leads to ataxia. So that's sort of the general understanding that we have. But what exactly happens when you inherit an expansion? Um, so there's been only one study looking at this so far. And you know, obviously there are other studies um, that are being conducted to validate this and to push this further. But what seems to happen is, is uh, in individuals with an expansion, they seem to have less protein, meaning that the gene produces less protein, probably because the gene cannot be read normally when you have this expansion. And um, there's this one study where we basically looked at uh, cerebellum from patient postmortem and cells derived from patient. And what we observed was basically a lower level of RNA for that gene and a lower level of protein in uh, patients compared to controls. Now, uh, in terms of pathology, so um, obviously there haven't been many pathological examinations performed yet. So we've looked at three cases so far and the pathological process seems to involve mostly the generation of neurons in the cerebellum, but particularly the Purkinje cells, which are you know, very important, uh, very important cell types in the cerebellum. So it doesn't seem to be lots of degeneration in other regions of the brain, brainstem, <coughs> and cord. And that uh, nicely reflects the fact, as Dr. Bray will mention in a, in a moment, that most individuals with scot 27 b actually mostly have ataxia and not much extra cerebellar features, which is probably you know, reflected also by the fact that you don't see degeneration a lot elsewhere than the, than the cerebellum. So now I just want to say a word about diagnosis. Um, so as of today, there is uh, one CLIA certified lab that offers testing on a clinical basis in North America. And that's a, a lab uh, at the University of Chicago led by Soma Das. Um, so if, if you wonder whether or not you should get tested, you should discuss this with your uh, healthcare provider and or neurologist, and they can advise whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is advisable for you to get tested or not. Um, in terms of the indications to get tested, so obviously we're still, you know, we're still early after the discovery of this disease. And so things may change at our, as our understanding evolves over time. Um, but what we do recommend is that obviously if you have a first degree relative or someone in your family affected by SCOT 27B, and you also have symptoms of ataxia, then of course, this is an indication for testing. If you develop ataxia in adulthood, you know, after age of 30, uh, so later in life, as scot 27 b is more of a late onset disease, then it is advisable to get testing, to get tested, sorry, if your features, if your, your phenotype, if your clinical features are, are uh, compatible with that of scot 27 b and the reason we say that it's because we believe it's it's essential to avoid misdiagnosis ca 27 b in cases with a very different phenotype, especially if uh, you are found to have an incompletely penetrant allele. So these smaller expansion, so are they causative in your case? Are they not? This is a little more tricky to tell. And so this is you know one of the reason why you know saying compatible phenotype helps to mitigate these risks. And what we and other colleagues, different colleagues around the globe have observed is in individuals with a very different phenotype from scot 27 b who are also found to have uh, an expansion in FGF14, well, more often than not, you'll also find a mutation in another ataxia-causing gene, which explains most of the phenotype, most of the features of this disease. And so 
this is why we and you know others believe that um, having a compatible phenotype is is important or a good genotype clinical correlation is necessary when interpreting the test. And but these in a nutshell are I would say the the indication of who should get tested. And so on that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brick for the for the clinical features of SCOT 27B. Thank you, David. Uh, next slide. So uh, before I talk about the clinical presentation, I realize that uh, I, though it was on mention on the slide, you, you should know that there is an Australian group led by Paul Lockhart, who from Melbourne did publish at the same month, also a confirmatory study showing the mutation also in the gene. And the, the, data, the clinical data I'm gonna to present today is based on our experience. And, and, and most of you in other countries uh, are maybe part of other studies because most uh, big ataxia uh, clinics are, are now collecting or even have published their series of patients with this disease. So David said uh, late onset, uh, 30 and above. That's a definition we use. It's based on historical things. But in fact, this is a disease that is often later in onset. And that's important for the people on, the, on the, the call today that don't have a diagnosis yet. So most people do start later, more in their 50s and 60s. And in fact, it's more permanent ataxia. That means daily ataxic symptoms is often more late 50s, early 60s, and probably around 60 on average. So uh, though there are cases that are earlier and some are very, uh, very early, that's a general presentation. But it's very wide, as, as, as mentioned on this slide, you can start in their 30s, as you can start in their 90s. Uh, and, and we don't know why, though we suspect that the size of the mutation is one of the factors. But as David pointed out, the data is not out on that yet. It is a progressive disease, and I will come back to some of those elements a little bit further in, in the next few slides. And what's important to remember is that, particularly in families that will, are being tested, is you may not have the same size as your brother and sister or your mother who was affected, who is affected. Uh, and we don't, we, uh, the size will not tell you if you're going to have it more or less than that parent. It, it's not so straightforward. So there's no performance issue. I think uh, David insisted on the fact there is a clear threshold of 300 below needs interpretation and size and certainly comparing between each other in the same family with different sizes, probably not very informative at this point. Hopefully it, it may give you more information. So don't, don't compare too much, but the important thing, it's a late onset and usually with the family history. Thanks, David. Very important for the diagnosis, and I think that's well helping a lot of our colleagues in ataxia clinics worldwide. It's all this idea of the episodic start. So most studies are finding that, and, and certainly that was very important in our study. And, and in fact, my way of perceiving those patients in the clinic, even before the genetic diagnosis, is that they have episodic symptoms. Those can be really very short lasting, a few minutes, a few hours, sometimes a bit longer. They're usually not many days, and they are usually balance issues. So people will present with uh, vertigo, double vision, uh, they may have a slurred speech for a while, uh, and, and, and it will go away. Uh, some of the people during that period also describe peculiar symptoms. Uh, it came from one of the Americans family, they call it a brain fog, a kind of state where they, they don't think they're thinking properly, they often will retrieve or will, will not talk for a while until they get better. It's may or may not be associated with headaches. Sometimes it's very dramatic. Some of the vertigo are so dramatic that the people will show up in the emergency room with severe uh, vertigo. So in the same family, all those symptoms that come and go could suggest that you may have and sadly inherited this mutation that's in your family, and that should prompt uh, medical um, counsel. Uh, because in fact, it's better to know that you have it than having necessarily all the other workup or being treated for something you don't have, which is what happens in some family, extensive treatment for vascular risk and so forth, when in fact, it is the same disease as other people. The permanent state comes later. Uh, and, 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 and that's usually, there can be 10, 15 years after the first symptoms or, or, or even more. The, um, another thing that may point uh, to uh, you may have this condition. It's one of those episodic attacks that has triggers. One of the most dramatic for me uh, asking to patients was the alcohol. So many of, the, many of those families, they would tell us, oh, I don't know, we don't drink alcohol. Almost the entire family knows that they're hypersensitive to alcohol. Very little alcohol and they will be uh, more ataxic. Uh, and so they, had, they get all the 
coordination side effects, but before getting all the euphoric uh, positive side effects of taking alcohol. So it's really, that's a, that can be a key to it. Obviously, if you don't drink a lot, you're more sensitive, but this is more dram dramatic. Then there's the physical activity. That's very, very uh, peculiar, uh, and it's described in other form of atta episodic attacks. But in these cases, I'll always remember one of the first patients I've seen, uh, he was brought, when my colleague brought him to my clinic and said, look, you have to see this guy. And so he was walking pretty good, pretty athletic fellow, and he made him run the entire corridor. And at the end of the corridor, his voice had, had become dysarthric, and he, he walked as if he had dr drunk too much alcohol. So this kind of exercise and do so, and it can be subtle. You walk two kilometers with your dog, and at the end, whoops, a little bit more tipsy. More recently, we've been picking up that some patients are caffeine sensitive. So, uh, so that's another hint that, oh, maybe I have it at the end, or maybe it's this form. So I'm not saying it's absolute, it's just something to keep in mind. The, the double vision is quite dramatic. Some people come very early uh, to the uh, to medical evaluation because they have downbeat nystagmus and they, they will see double, uh, and, and some of them with time will have to have uh, prisms installed. So it's one of the attacks of that we, if they, they late you have a prism already for because of double vision in your glasses, that would hint maybe this is the form. And the vertigo can be uh, very variable, but I think the little graph that uh, Catherine Ashton prepared uh, below shows you this idea that you may have this kind of period of 10 or 15 years of episodic symptoms, then the permanent ataxia, probably around the 60, and then you will use uh, walking aids and, and wheelchair use, at least in our experience, and it seems the experience of most people is, is uh, not very frequent uh, in these patients. So most of them continue to work, not all, but uh, walk. The, the important thing is to, to realize that it's, it's a very slow uh, duration and it, it lasts for a very, very long time and involves much slower than most ataxia. Um, um, and so the, the, this is something that makes it a milder form, it doesn't, and, but it makes it also one of the challenges in establishing what treatment we will use for the slow evolution. Next slide. So uh, compared, to, it's on the same theme compared to other attacks that are late onset, for example, SCA6, which is the kind of prototype of these. And it's, this ataxia evolves even slower on average than SCA6. Uh, so it's a late onset, but even slower. It has also uh, all those features of, of that can be associated with the very um, more vestibular impar impairment, more tremor, uh, Neuropath neuropathy doesn't seem to be a very frequent, spasticity is not very frequent, Parkinsonian sign is not very frequent, urinary agency is not very frequent, so things that may point more in one direction than the other. It doesn't mean that they're not present, but they're less present on average with these people, but very slow evolving, and that's maybe for you who are at the beginning of your course that and, and have no family history. It's a third of patients in large series that have no family history. So they, they you learn about this, but you have no way to compare it to a parent, an uncle, a, a brother, a cousin. So it is slow progressive. And that's important because some of the late onset ataxia, like multisystem atrophy, cerebellar subtypes are reasonably fast evolving, and they can be very, very handicapped producing on a very short period of time. This is not the case in this form. Next slide. Um, so the, this is a slide from the NAF. I'll go to the other one. I think it's, it's maybe. So unfortunately, so the, uh, unfortunately it's, no, let, let's return to the slide. I'll have a few comments on the others. Sorry, David. So um, the MRI, shows change, so it can help the physicians to say, well, you really have an attack and it shows a cerebellar change, and, 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 and there's, there's a lot of international work on that to try to see if we can do more on the imagery. Uh, there's more and more information on the disease, so they, they, we, we, we hopefully will have more on the web to tell you more about this condition. Uh, so, uh, symptomatic treatment are maybe on the way, or some people have already been exposed to potential symptomatic treatment. I'll say a little bit about that. Then it's all the question, will physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, language therapy, I think they're all part of the, of the um, allied professionals who can help you 
live with these conditions the best possible and diminish your your uh, risk of falling and and your use of of your hands and so forth and and improve your speech uh, so i think they're all uh, useful there's no study obviously at this point to show their contribution in this type but in, in others we've seen that they can be very useful um, next slide so there are unfortunately no cure for uh, for SCA 27 at this time, and I've already mentioned the the, the use of physiotherapy. We do that in our rehab clinics, and 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 uh, and we see that they improve. Uh, we use a lot of walking sticks in Canada for these patients, and that's very useful, particularly the ones who are still very big walkers and will have some uh, gait instability after a long walk. They, they, walking stick seems to help them a, a lot. Obviously, other ambulators and, and such tools can uh, can be uh, useful for the urinary urgency that is not universal and by any means. I mean, there are uh, med medical treatments, the spasticity, there are exercise and medical treatment. Again, not very common at, in my experience, and we follow maybe 100, 110 people we saw over the years at this point with this condition and spasticity has not been a big, big issue. And then the question of avoiding alcohol, I think I don't People with this condition and many ataxic avoid alcohol anyhow because the cerebellum is particularly sensitive uh, to alcohol. Avoiding physical activity is more placing yourself at risk of falling. So I'm, I'm always encouraging people to be physically active, but you need to understand how, how your body will respond to exercise. And most people are, um, are um, already adapted to that conditions. I have some patients who, in fact, prefer to walk a lot. They feel that they're better if they walk a lot, then not, not walk, so or walk minimally. So it's something that you have to adjust to based on your own experience of your body in exercise. Next slide. So I, I can't go into the details. It's not my, 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 my specialty to, to, to talk about all of them, but always think in the NAF approach and, and multidisciplinary approach that in clinics, in NAF approved clinics or big ataxia clinics, the, you will be uh, offered different uh, counsel and, and, and recommendation by different allied professionals. And that's often very useful. In this conditions, what we found is that they, they respond to physiotherapy, the occupational therapy play less of a role. Speech therapy has been very useful uh, for some of those patients to learn to slow their output uh, and, and therefore be more comprehensible. And the prisms have been uh, remarkably uh, useful in those patients. What, for the people who are not familiar, it's really wearing a prism in one of your glasses one, and one of your lens to try to allow the two images to overlap. Uh, next. So many of you who follow this, uh, this field and, and, and uh, they have a bit, or probably realized that one of the exciting things about finding this mutation is probably one of the reasons why the New England was also interested in publishing our paper uh, is that the idea that it's the same, the letters that are of the repeat are the same as in Friedreich's ataxia. And most people in, in, at NAF know about this, but this is a most common recessive ataxia and it's been, the, the gene has been cloned a long time ago. And there are uh, there have been clinical trials, and now there are new um, um, medications that are targeted for that repeat. In, in Friedreich ataxia, you get two large repeats from your parents, and then you develop a disease that has variable age of onset and may be multisystemic, may have the heart and so forth and other organs. But if you could arrange that these GA uh, expansions start working again, allow the gene to be expressed, then you would think that the, a lot of those uh, effects of the, of the mutation would disappear. And there's many evidence for that, but uh, that's not the major theme. But there is clearly a lot of exciting work on these type of approaches. And therefore, SCA27 is poised to benefit from this tremendous research investment to try to cure uh, Friedreich. So I think the two, they're like cousins in a way. They, they will, uh, one will help the other uh, in, in accelerating uh, new, new uh, treatment avenues in those disease. However, there's been some trial in, uh, or experience, I should say, uh, in these patients. And we've learned a, a fair amount and we are 
uh, hoping to have a phase two, uh, phase two, uh, um, phase three uh, placebo control trial uh, uh, done in the next, started in the next few months. We I can't tell you more. It's 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 clearly a subject of great interest, but I don't have privileged data to tell you more at this point. But what was interesting in in some of the studies uh, in some of the clinic is that when they went back and looked at the people who responded better than others to 4-aminopyridine. And even in our first group, some of the German patients had been exposed to 4-aminopyridine. Uh, they were the best responders. And that that became a kind of, wait a minute, this is strange. It's almost, uh, you could almost say they have this disease if they responded. Not only were the best responders, they were the responders. So that, and that's really where we we found ourselves at the at the publication of the paper. And then since then, other data has been added. So on the left side, what we're trying to see is to see uh, you show on on the second panel, you show that in fact uh, the the patients on off uh, the medication. And, and maybe it's better illustrated on the right panel uh, from something that should be published soon. I hope is if you put a patient. Not, if he's not on the drug, so the blue uh, dot, and then you put him on the drug, then his far stage, so it's far is, is the impact of the, um, of the um, medication, sorry, the, the uh, uh, decreases on a daily basis. And there's many groups that have tried to look at, at different methods. The bottom line for you is that there is growing evidence that this medication could be a symptomatic treatment, whether it will delay the, if you tolerate it, will it delay the progression of the disease? All of those, those things are not known. Unfortunately, in many countries like in Canada, it's not available as a therapeutic modalities for this indication. So that that's the need to do um, a true study to show that it's efficacious. But the data, the data is building uh, to suggest that it may be a symptomatic drug. So. One year after the publication, we may be in a position to launch a trial uh, to address this issue and maybe help many of you on, on the call today and others who will be diagnosed over time to have a sym symptomatic treatment. And because it's episodic, uh, maybe early treatment will in fact have a huge impact on, on, on quality of life for, for many uh, patients. Next uh, slide. So before we, we thank everyone, I think we're, we're, the, there are other drugs that have been tried in different clinics, uh, Dimox, uh, acetazolamide, and, and, and Nexily. The data is not as strong to suggest that these are good modalities. So certainly they're available now, for example, in Canada, but we, our, our experience have not been very favorable. So I think the future is bright uh, in the sense that we're providing many uh, patients with a new diagnosis we're explaining why it's different in the families yes we're we're bringing the the, the we're allowing families to do testing um, and hopefully we'll give them a, a better idea of what it means to carry a small expansion in terms of probability of developing the disease for example the people who've had received their mutation from a father and the mutation has shrank in size will they develop or not we are certainly looking for that and there's we're learning a lot about the, the molecular basis. Uh, David uh, shared with you the kind of basic elements to start to prepare your brain for our research seminar, which will our talk it will be in, in December, where we'll try to uh, present to you some of the ideas that are, are going around and some of the hypotheses as to why this error is really leading to the problem and, and, and what, what can we do to use that uh, new knowledge to try to develop better uh, treatments. So on that, I want to thank NAF for their great invitation at Taxia Canada to have help us to do the first French version, um, help our huge network of clinicians at, from you all over the world. You should know this is a very, uh, it's done in a very open uh, collaboration in over 40 countries in the world. People are contributing. And and uh, and I want to thank uh, very uh, warmly David for preparing the slide, but also playing this very uh, incredible role of coordination with all these collaborators in the world and 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 keeping uh, and working hard and and still being uh, uh, willing to do even more for for the project but more for for the families so thank you very much david you want to find have a final word on your side uh no i think i think uh it was it was very clear i guess uh, thank you all for attending and and we'll both be happy to take questions 
Thank you both so much for a fantastic presentation. Just a reminder for attendees, if you do have questions, to please drop them in the Q&A window. We're going to get to as many as we can in the next 18 minutes or so. And there's been a few people asking if the recording, uh, how they can access this information uh, after the webinar ends. A recording of this presentation is going to be made on the NAF YouTube page in a few weeks. So stay tuned for that if you'd like to review some of the material or the slides afterwards. Uh, so to start off, we have a clarification question from someone who's seen a couple of different terms thrown around. Uh, what are the differences between SCA 27A and SCA 27B? Why are they being labeled this way? So David, take that one, I think. Sure. Um, so before so before that repeat expansion was discovered, there was a disease called SCA 27. SCA 27 has been discovered, I think, in 2003 or five, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, by a Dutch group, um, and and only you know a handful of cases have been reported since then. But these cases were not caused by the repeat expansion, but were caused by conventional quote unquote mutation or point mutation in the gene. And that's COT twenty seven as we used to know it uh, uh, is is different from SCOT twenty seven in the sense that it tends to present earlier with more upper limb tremor, with more neuropsychiatric symptoms, for instance. And after the discovery of the expansion, because it was in the same gene in FGF14, what OMIM, which is basically the, um, which is a, a, a an organization basically that names or gives name or standardized name to uh, new genetic disease, decided to rename SCOT27 to SCOT27A, and that disease caused by repeat expansion as cot 27 b to make the distinction that both are within the same gene, yet are caused by different mutations or different genetic errors, if you will. Thanks for oh, clarifying that. Yeah, and, and, and it's important, we didn't choose the name. <laughs> we, that's not the name we suggested. It's really the, the body that decided to call it that way. So That's good to know. And then we have a question about the point mutations that cause uh, or along the lines of SCA27A, is it possible for someone to have a point mutation in FGF14 as well as an expansion? And in that case, what they, what should they do? Should they have their genome reanalyzed? Uh, or could you provide any clarification about this? I don't think we have many of those. Uh, David, you want to answer? So in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone who carries both a mutation in FGF14 and an expansion. Um, and now you should know that Mutations in FGF14 are rare to begin with. They're really not common. As I mentioned, there are only a handful of cases of what was known as SCOT27 that have been reported since its description. And so to begin with, this is rare. Uh, and so it would be even rarer to have someone with an expansion and a mutation. So I'm, I'm, I'm not aware if that has ever been reported. Um, so I may have found, uh, we may have found one case in Quebec recently, but it's not confirmed yet. So it's possible, but it would be, I think the important thing, extremely rare. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, it underlines the fact that the clinic and the genetics have to be put together to really make the, this is the cause of your problem. And, and in, in the complex ones like this, family segregation, all these studies to be sure that what we saw as a point difference or point mutation is really causal if you mm -hmm. find the expansion and 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 that that takes real expertise so the genetic counselors the geneticists the neurogenesis can contribute to this debate to try to it's very to try to give you a clear answer because it's important obviously for the risk yeah. for the rest of the family members well thanks for clearing that up our next couple of questions have to do with repeat expansions in fgf14 uh so the first question is if is the number of alleles that someone has or rather the number of expansions that someone has in their allele determine at birth, or can it be modified throughout their lifetime? This uh, speaker has heard about repeat expansions and triplet repeat disorders and is wondering if the same thing could happen in this condition. David? Um, so what we, what we know basically is that if you take the same individual and you measure the size of their expansion in the blood, say 20 years apart, I think the longest we've looked at is 25 years, that doesn't change. So it doesn't seem to change in the blood, uh, but that's all we can say so far because that's all the data we have. Um, so it doesn't seem to change over time in the blood. Whether this is true in you know skin cells or other cells, this is not information we have at this time, uh, but in the blood doesn't seem to be a change uh, over time. One of those things about this discovery being so new, there's still a lot we're learning about it. Exactly. On that note, there's someone who's interested in 
uh, differences in repeat expansions depending on cell type. Uh, so is there any information known about uh, variability and repeat count between uh, blood samples, saliva, cheek swabs, anything of that nature? Um, so I, 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 we don't have data to compare, for instance, saliva versus blood. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be able to answer this question as to other cells. Um, so we've looked at the difference, for instance, between fibroblasts, so the, the, mm -hmm. the skin cell and the blood. Uh, there may be a little bit of difference, but it's not, you know, it's not major. But again, these are peripheral cell, um, and we haven't looked this comprehensively on a large number of, of individuals. So uh, again, my answer is cautious and uh, partial. And then you touched on this a little bit earlier, but if you could elaborate a little bit more, we have someone who's interested in uh why scot 27 b seems to be episodic for some folks. Uh, is there a repeat uh, allele range that uh, could be more predictive of someone having an episodic phenotype versus a more stable phenotype? Is there any information known about this or research being done in this area? Maybe I can take that one. This is very speculative. I think the mm -hmm. idea is uh, probably the you have one good copy and one bad copy, eh? and the bad mm -hmm. copy just doesn't express a lot. And so we think that because it's highly expressed in the cerebellum, particularly in the Purkinje cell, with time, the role of the FGF14 of organizing those channels is distorted and places the cell uh, in a way that it's vulnerable to chemical challenges like alcohol, caffeine, mm -hmm. to exercise change metabolic and maybe acidity, maybe something else. And therefore, it, it places the cell in, in, in a vulnerable state. Why it degenerates ultimately that it says, bye-bye, I don't want to do the work anymore. And, and then the entire system stays in a kind of permanent, uncoordinated state that we obviously don't know. It's, it's a fundamental and very important question, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we still don't know. Thanks for explaining what we do know and what we're looking forward to uh, figuring out more about. Uh, we have a person here in, who's attending who has uh, been tested for SCA27B. Uh, they now know their repeat length and they're wondering at this point, is there any other clinical testing that they should do? Um, they're wondering how to proceed if they ha have a repeat length that's within that pathogenic range. Uh, do you mean uh, above 300? That, that the is diagnosis correct. is 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 clear. Then it's more uh, go for more multidisciplinary care and and ensuring that uh, that the uh, you follow the the field. So if another other treatments become available, you'll be informed, and I'm sure you will follow the field for that. And then it's the impact on transmission. What does it mean having a having a, 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 path, a pathogenic mutation and for your, the rest of your family? And then it's more. Uh, how to share that information and how mm -hmm. have the people in the family have access to to expertise to help them. I think it becomes more problematic for people who are diagnosed with a, the phenotype, the clinical presentation, and have a, an expansion that's more in the 250 to 299 or even uh, below that. Then mm -hmm. it really means, and I think we're, we will insist on that, it really means that this has to be placed in the clinical setting. It means that, this has to be discussed with your neurologist um, to really ensure that you have enough clinical core features we call of this condition to say this is probably the cause and maybe even then do further familial exploration to convince them that why you had this size is because the parent who gave it to you had a, a, a size that also in that range or higher and, and make it and other people in your family also have expansion, and then it becomes a bit clearer. But it, it's still a gray zone. And but, folks, we're we're working hard to give it, you even a more clear picture, and that will require data sharing between a lot of people. And that's what we're working very hard on is to ensure that the international community will be sharing information to be giving us uh, clear answers to share with with patients and their family. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a collaborative effort for the I, I, ongoing no years. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned or uh, in the presentation uh, talks about how caffeine and alcohol can trigger uh, episode, uh, episodic symptoms. Uh, we have a clarification question from someone. Uh, will the consumption of caffeine and alcohol make degeneration pr uh, progress more faster or just amplify the symptoms? Is there anything known about that? No, I don't think there is. And, and uh, 
I think you have to listen to your own body in that sense that the impact and decide if, if the benefits or, or the pleasure uh, seeking is more than the negative, in fact, but whether it causes problem long term, I, I don't think so. But what we see is that some patients turn to decaf and some people will go very low alcohol and they still continue to drink, but it's they're making uh, big efforts to do that. I must say something and the the, the NAF is uh, has proposed to have SCA 27 be as part of their natural history uh, disease in the NAF uh, clinic. So that's that's in, in the process. So we have a clinic in Montreal who's NAF approved at the SHUM. And I think that so there will be data also generated by many group on following patients on a long period of time. And that may help also to to find a link between the clinical symptoms and size of mutation and how people evolve and obviously how they uh, respond to different clinical treatments. Now we're looking forward towards working towards that. That will give us tons of more information about scot 27 b the types of symptoms, how they progress over time, and hopefully we can give folks some more answers. And then uh, just going through the questions here, uh, now that we've entered an era where we do have a genetic test for SCA 27 b there's the possibility of folks uh, receiving a gen genetic diagnosis before they experience symptoms. Uh, we have an attendee who is interested in if there's any information about preventative measures or things that they can do ahead of time to uh, be their best selves, live as healthy as possible to delay symptoms. Is there anything known about that? Uh, not much, really. Uh, prevention is, is a big word for all of us. And I think it, I think the challenge will be, and it's it's not maybe not too far down the road, is if we have a medication that prevents those episodes, are we going to try to encourage people in in their younger age, almost pre symptomatic or early early symptoms, to get on those drugs earlier and mm -hmm. find out if it has an impact on the influence? But it's too early to do this type of design. So I think at this point, I, I think people just have to enjoy life and hope that. Even if their parent developed it at a certain age, they may develop it much later. So I don't, I don't have, I don't, there's no counterindication. And I must say, related to early pre-symptomatic treatment, this should not be done except if you're really well surrounded by your family, your spouse, the, uh, the, the, uh, the genetic counselors, the genetic, because uh, there's always implications of being found carrying a mutation that will develop a disease even in their 60s or later. And, and that should be well discussed. And, and there's a good time to test. And, and we're not saying because the test is available that everyone in the family should be tested, um, certainly not in the clinical environment. So it's a case by case uh, uh, benefit and, and, and potential negative effect of being found to be positive. It'd be a very personal decision and talking it over with your medical professional can uh, make things a little bit clearer about what's best for your situation. Yeah. And then our next couple of questions have to do uh, with different symptoms relating to SCOD 27B. Some folks are interested in clarifying if this is common for folks with SCOD 27B or if it uh, could be that they have um, another condition as well. Uh, so we have one attendee here who shares that he has cramps in his lower legs as well as his hands after the onset of um, uh, other symptoms. He's wondering if that's related to SCOD 27B. So leg cramps and uh, fine motor difficulties. I don't know if, if it's really muscular cramp. We haven't seen much of that. Uh, dysesthesia or uh, some sensory symptoms in the feet and so forth, maybe are they associated for sure? Not sure yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So no, that would not be, a, to me at this point, not something that I would say it's a, a frequent associated symptom. Okay, up next we have someone asking about essential tremor and if that is caused by SCOT 27B. There's a lot of debate about that. David, try to take that one. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think I think to properly answer that, we also need to place essential tremor in context, right? Which is mm -hmm. a, a heterogeneous disease, and it often, I think, uh, in clinical practice, might be sort of a, a a a mixed bag of different, you know, different conditions being lumped together. Um, so what we know, without yeah, and here I'm not saying that SCOT 27B causes essential tremor. What I'm saying basically is what mm -hmm. we know that individuals with SCOT 27 b certainly can have tremor of the arms and of the hands. And whether, you know, you were diagnosed with essential tremor before or any other type of tremor, I, you know, this is, I think, a case by case uh, basis, but certainly individuals with SCOT 27 b may have 
a rest tremor like you see in Parkinson's disease, for instance, or a postural tremor, an action tremor like you see in essential tremor, for instance. So there might be, you know, phenotypic overlap. Um, but I think it's it's always a little hard to speculate as to whether or not scot 27 b causes essential tremor when that mm -hmm. disease is so heterogeneous. Uh, and often, you know, diagnostic criteria are not very strictly applied either. So I don't want to don't want to say for sure that in the case of this person, you know, uh, they have that has cut twenty seven B. They have essential tremor too. Maybe it was just a misdiagnosis. Maybe they have two diseases together. So there's lots of different possibilities. And maybe a point on that is that yeah, tremor is part of the phenotype for sure. And but it, it, it's it's that spectrum. And even some of our older patients have tremors that are more Parkinsonian like. And that they may be classified as another Parkinsonian type of condition. Mm -hmm. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, so yes, so so it it, it it by no means exclude the disease, and it's probably part of the condition. If you have the mutation, the other features, and the tremor, they're probably all related. Thanks for walking us through that nuance. Uh, our next uh, symptom related to SCOT 27B is progressive weakness common for folks who've received a SCOT 27B diagnosis. Uh, our, my experience is not, uh, no proximal weakness, no distal weakness, so that's not something we see. One ha and it allows me to make a comment. We're talking about people who are usually above 60. Uh, mm. I'm also a muscle disease specialist, so as you age, many people develop proximal weakness. Many people mm -hmm. develop distal numbness. So we have to be sure that it, there may be something else, and it's maybe age-related in those patients that is additive and may contribute to the the, the burden uh, on walking and coordination, but they're, they're not, clear weakness I have not seen. In the spells, in the episodic episode, some people are very wobbly, they feel mm -hmm. hypotonic. And so that we see, but it's transitory and it's not related to weakness. And then up next, there's someone who wants to clarify what you meant by swallowing difficulty. Could this include someone who uh, is able to swallow food, but then it's not going down their esophagus? So dysphagia is not a major feature mm -hmm. on this condition. So granted, people have a lot of dysarthria, coordination problems, then you will have dysphagia. Some of, so some of the most severe, and I'm sure David and I have in mind the same patient, uh, really the speech was difficult, the entire mm -hmm. coordination. He had even stopped speaking and feeding was difficult, but that's an exception. Uh, most people in their 80s are still eating essentially normal diet with a little bit more of, of mishap of, of maybe a little bit more choking and taking a little bit more time. But it, it's not a disease where the dysphagia is, is a huge problem. David, is there anything from the studies of others on that? No, I agree. Um, you know, I think swallowing difficulty is is may develop, especially later in the disease course, if it develops, uh, but is I think overall less than 50% to end up having swallowing difficulties. And as you mentioned, it tends to remain mild as well, so. And then one final question. Uh, you mentioned that caffeine and alcohol can be potential triggers for the episodic nature of SCOT 27B. Uh, can general stress also uh, exacerbate symptoms? That's a really a great question. We see that in episodic ataxias. I mean, they, you know, they don't want to be in line they get at one point, they feel their balance is changing. They, they, they really, so I, I, my feeling at this point, and I don't know for sure, because I think there's no math, mathematical numbers at this point, but some people really in certain position, it, it does provoke an episodic, but it's again, it's more, I believe what my patients tell me. And so they do express that. And some of them will take, uh, uh, not only with this form of episodic attacks, but other will take medication to try to calm them down because they, they feel they're not, they, their chances of having another spell is not there. But I, I besides that, anxiety is so, so wide uh, an experience of life that I, I, I'm not sure. But I, I think if you get clear episode of dysarthria and gait instability in periods where you're really stressed out you're like waiting in line or you're you're uh, i probably it's related but it, time will tell us for sure but uh, but uh, probably related. Uh, david do you do you want to add something on that no no that's pretty comprehensive well 
at that point, we are at the top of our time. So thank you both so much for providing this fantastic overview of SCA 27B. For anyone who's still on the call, uh, we're going to be having another session focusing more so on the research that's being done on SCA 27B in December. There's going to be uh, information available through that through the NAF website. So if everyone can join me at our individual Zoom screens, uh, thanking Dr. Bray and Dr. Pellerin for sharing their time and expertise with us. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, so thank you. And thanks to all of you for attending today and learning a little bit more about SCA 27B. I hope you found this session helpful. And wherever you are in the world, uh, have a good night, good evening, good morning. And we look forward to seeing you at another webinar in the future. Have a good day, folks. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one.